It's time to start. Go ahead. So the, the general setup So general setup, we're a big document, right? And there's a bunch of text, right? And there's multiple fonts being used. So of course, we're not displaying the document, right? We're just trying to understand how much space well we're trying to do two things right one is to understand how the flyweight pattern works and then how much space it uses and of course understanding how it works is sort of incorporates the space issues right and when you read the pattern right it just says well you've got this intrinsic state an extrinsic state and we can store the extrinsic state somewhere else and of course, it really doesn't go into where that other place is, right? It just says, well, it can be over there or over there, right? But not here. Um, but of course, it has to be stored someplace. Um, <clears throat> so when your example is small enough and there's only one font change, then it's like, okay, there's font A and font B, and I'm done, right? But when you have a regular, you know, bigger document, you might have you know, a title and then some paragraphs and a header and more paragraphs, right? And all those characters in the paragraphs are all the same font. And so there'll be, you know, okay, header font, now it's paragraph font, paragraph font, paragraph font, paragraph font, now, now you know, subtitle font, right? And then paragraph font, paragraph font. And so it's when you're, in theory, right, when we're reading the document, we have to, we'll be going back and forth with different fonts. Well, so again, we can go back to not just the font, but the, the characters, right? Um, you know, say we have some text. All right. But yes, there are a couple of things we're faking, right? How do we store this all this information, right? That's a reading from a file. Um, but how are, we, how are we using the factory for the characters? Well, you say there's an H, so give me give me the H character, right? And I uh, give me the I character, and now give me the M character, right? Um, and 
the reason we do that is because when you have lots and lots of characters, right, then having the flyweight for the characters is going should save us a lot of space, right? Now fonts, how many fonts? How many fonts do you want in a single document? It's hard to imagine more than 20, right? Um, so there, right, yeah, we can use the flyweight pattern for the fonts, but the savings is going to be hard to talk about, right? Because if you've got three fonts, then the flyweight pattern really doesn't apply because the flyweight pattern says when you have lots of little things, right? And three or 20 doesn't sound like a lot. Right. Right, 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 right. So if you have that, a lot, and you use bold in a lot of places, you have to use your section by all yeah. things that you're saving. Yeah. To have the same, to have, to have everything the same bold, the same regular you know, as you go back. Makes forth. sense, yeah. yeah. But it does save space. Not a whole lot, but yeah, yeah it'll, it'll save space. Depends on how many times it's bold. Right, yeah, I mean, <laughs> You know, if you want to read a character, it's made bold, right? I mean, but it's the same situation, right? When I come across the, you know, you know, is it bold or italic? Is it Times Roman, etc., right? Um, right. Right. Well, um, but, but keep in mind, right, when we're using the character factory, right, we still need to store those characters in the right sequence. So in a character situation, we still have some sort of container, an array or array list or whatever, right, with the various characters, right? Now, now it's the same thing with, so the, you just got the, you know, so you got one H, you got one I, and one M, and one O, and right. So we got these pointers, a space, and a space, and then an M, and an M, and an O, right? This it's the same situation with the runner array, is right? Okay, we'll we're we'll gonna have some sort of you know factory which contains all the font, separate, different fonts, and then a runner array, right? At some point, you're gonna have you know, font A, so you have font A and B and C, and so you've got, right, whenever you use more than one of them, you know, we'll have a, basically a singleton-like object for the, each font, right, and then run array, when you've got runs of different, runs the same font in different locations, instead of having, copying that object, we can have a pointer to it, same as we do up here. Yeah, it's, it's basically, you know, for me, the only difference is the number of characters, right? I mean, you got two data structures, right? Um, storing information about this sequence. And instead of repeating that same, copying that same object over and over again, we're going to have pointers to a canonical representation. Well, so what do we mean by work, right? So the goal of this assignment is not to produce a piece of software that we can run, right? You may, you may use software, right? Well, um, so the question is, how do we show how we compute the space, right? 
Um, so the question, first question is, what, what class of objects do you need? And how many of them do you need? And how much space does each one take? You could do that, or you could just say, look, here's here's my design. I need this character class. I need this run array class. I need this factory class. I need, right, here, here are all the classes I need. Um, and then, you know, here's how many bytes each one takes. Yeah, like you said, a report, right? Yeah, I mean, that's. So for unit tests, the only thing that seems complex is the unit test. Yeah, is, is there really no testing, right? I mean, it's, yeah. well, unit testing is 10%, so I figured it out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just the, for the flyways, the code is like by inspection. Yeah, that is my standard template grading. I, should have modified it. Yeah, that's easy to do, right? Most languages have a built-in test for that. Or, but you're testing whether or not your your factory is really a factory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just don't, it returns the same thing twice. We're checking the rest. There's one line of code. One condition. It's there. It gives you back the one that's yeah. there. Otherwise, make a new one. Yeah. I could use test it. I just. It's my inspection. Yeah, your point you need to test something, right? Um, yeah, so the question is, should be the operations? Well, the goal here is to understand how much space takes up, right? Um, and we're not, we're not computing how much space the methods take. Sure. I mean, it depends what, I mean. What about the um, Well, there's two, there's two parts of the question. Should there be any operations in your, in your assignment or whether it will be operations in general, right? Um, if you did it for real, if we're doing this for real, we, at some point we, if we're building this word, word processor using objects, right, as in chapter two, um, at some point we need to display it, right? And at that point we then have to, you know, take this character and also know what font it's going to use, right, to display it properly. And so there's operations there that need to be done. And with the font, right? I mean, you know, we write that down um, and say it's just an A. But how do you how do you display that? You know, it used to be, it was all bitmaps, right? So you had a bunch of bitmaps and you just, just there was an A bitmap and a B bitmap, right, in different sizes. But that, well, 
No, it's just yes. Right, yes. <laughs> there's no earthquake or no. Yeah, no badger or some. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so it, it, if you actually display it, there's a lot of operations going there, right? But for this assignment, just the goal is how does the flyway pattern work? How much space do you save, right? And by space, we're not talking about the methods. Just, um, you know, you have to look at the, the machine language code generated, or in Java case, the byte code generated to figure out how much space it takes. But that's independent of the size of the document, right? So we don't, we don't worry about that so much. So can the flyway take more space? Um, For example, there is some text which has Yeah, just take that text, right? Hi, mom. So then, but we also need the runaway, right? And we also have the two factories. So are we gonna save space by, Text as small. So in that case, the thing we are using rather a factory as additional. Right. So that's what we are creating the object. Right. We want additional How how would you write a unit test for that? I mean, well, I mean we're we're only required to calculate the space savings for this type of the string. So right. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Now, if you want to do more, that's good. I mean, you know, understanding the you know, the constraints is good. But. Nice. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> I didn't mean for it to be a hard assignment, right? So I think the question is, in the flyweight pattern, we've got the intrinsic state and extrinsic state, right? And the flyweight pattern says, well, we can then use flyweights if we extract the extrinsic state and put it somewhere else, right? And then the issue becomes, at some point, you need to come back together again. Um, yeah, so, You know, in this example now, right, so we, we have an array with just the characters without the font information. And then we got some another structure which has the run array for the fonts, right? So when, when I display this H, I also have to then go and say, oh, well, it's in position zero, so go, what font is in position zero? Now I can just, now I can combine the two together and display it. 
So reading it, you know, displaying this becomes having to look where you are here, find the corresponding location here, and get that font. And then we can now we've got the, the two pieces of information we want to display. Right. Well, so yeah, in this example, right, if we're storing characters, if the characters include the font information, then we can't use a flyaway because di different M's, right, can have different fonts. Um, and so the, the flyaway pattern hides certain difficulties. Well, they don't talk about it. They just say, well, look, we can extract the intrinsic state. Extrinsic state goes over here, and then intrinsic state can go in the flyweight objects. In the flyweight pattern, the, extr the extrinsic state is usually passed to methods. In on the object, flyway. right, when you want to then use the actual, right. But the, the, what they gloss over then is we need to store the extrinsic state someplace, and then when we actually want to use those objects, we have to get the right extrinsic state and put it into the object and which of course makes things more difficult, right? Because now you, you, you basically separated pieces out and now we have to combine them together when we need it. Put it in. You don't ever really put, put it, it in. in. You're always passing. You're always passing. As soon as you put it in, you did. Because the problem is, because the problem is, right? If you, you know, if you got a hundred A's, right, and you, they all point to the same object. As soon as you put a font in there, all of them point to the same font, right? And so, yeah, you basically pass in as an argument to a method. You do whatever you need to do with it, and then. It's like a parameter, right? You don't you don't store the field in that. Which means every time you need the font in this case, you have to make sure you pass it in. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? So as you all know, right, um, next Wednesday is the last day of classes. So we have one more class, right? And the following week, we have a little exam. Um, so next Tuesday, bring will be a review. So bring questions you have about the, the final exam. Um, 
So it wasn't quite clear what to, what to talk about today. So I'll do something totally different. Um, <clears throat> a pizza party? No, I didn't bring any pizza. That'd be, pizza for 50 would be big stack, right? Um, so basically, um, what I'm talking about is, you know, what to do next, right? Uh, so if you're interested in the things I talk about in this course, you know, what do you do um, once the course is over? And so I want to talk about a few few references to look at. Um, one is Martin Fowler. He has what he calls the Blinky. And I haven't bothered to figure out what where that word came from. Um, you know, he has a rather famous author in, in the software world. He's written a number of books. Um, he even has his own book series that he gets to select people to write books for, you know, and put his name, his the Martin Fowler series by, um, and generally he's, he's a very well-respected um, author and speaker in the software world. He goes around, he gets to go to lots of places and they give talks and they pay him a lot. And um, He also works for a company called ThoughtWorks, which is you know, basically a high-end consulting company. Um, and they get to do lots of fun things. And um, and so his Blinky is, is is worth following. Um, you know, most blog posts, you know, are like three paragraphs long and they don't go into very detail. Um, it's not the case here. It, his posts will go on for pages. Um, and often they're so long that they come out in installments. Like, like I had another page and it had five pages. Um, so you get notifications for several weeks about the same article he's building up. And he also has other people at ThoughtWorks that will contribute and write articles. Um, so he has this um, section on architecture, and he's got a section on what is architecture, um, why does architecture matter, and then he has you know various articles on different aspects in architecture. And again, these are not, you know, some of them are page long, some of them are 15 pages long. Um, so it's, it's worth just describing to his RSS feed and just keeping track or go to his website occasionally and see what he's posted there. Um, you know, so the microservices, micro front ends, GUI architectures, service architectures, right? So it's not just um, often it's things that wouldn't quite fit in his books or things that will fit into a book later on. Um, but it's just, they're just too new or the thoughts are too new that, you know, books take a long time to you accumulate the material, and then once you get the material, it takes you, you know, it could take a year or two to publish, to write it, and then it takes another three months, right, for the go back and forth with the galley proofs and get the print, and then, right. Um, you know, so recent posts he's done, you know, exploratory testing. Continuous delivery for machine learning. Um, you know, it's just things that keep you current, get, let you know, you know, what some of the things that people are thinking about in greater detail than just machine learning is great, or you know, how do you, how do you integrate machine learning into continuous 
you know, delivery system. Another interesting thing what they do is every so often, I'm not sure it's every year, I think it might be every year, um, they come out with their technology radar and they look at four different areas, techniques, tools, platforms, and languages and frameworks. And each area, the less things that you you should be thinking about adopting things which you should be, you know, put in trial, um, assess just to think about, and then hold is maybe, you know, not worry about. And you have to keep in mind that they're primarily targeted toward the enterprise, and enterprise usually is a little bit slower on the uptake on things. Um, you know, startup companies are usually more far more willing to take risk and you know adopt technologies earlier on. Um, so it's an example. So the latest one came out this week, last week, I forget you know, when it came out. Um, you know, and techniques is adopt. Um, You know, here's this list, and they will then give you know, a, you know, three or four short paragraph explanation of what why I think it's important and what it's about. Um, but even just okay, what does run cost as architecture fitness function, right? Um, so often, just you know, reading the the document, you start learning, oh, I have no idea what this means. What is it, right? Um, and it's not going to, it's not a book. It's not It's not going to tell you how to do it. It's like, oh, it's just, here's something I didn't know existed. Um, maybe it sounds interesting. I should go look up, or maybe, I don't know. I don't care about that. But it, it just keeps you aware of things which are go happening in the field. Um, Right, so, you know, again, more items. And then it's like, song, tie, like what? Um, well, it's a, it's a system that came, was developed at Alibaba. Um, and basically, You know, they're addressing one of the problems that was we were looking at earlier is like how do you how do you encapsulate business models um, and you want to do it quickly, right? Um, Alibaba was known for being you know very quick to change direction and do things very quickly. Um, so they developed this technique. Um, so again, it's when you read their document, it's not going to explain what the process is. It tells you a little bit about it. I mean, you make it makes you aware there's this thing going on, and perhaps you might look further into it, right? Now, as an aside, um, has anyone heard of Conway's Law? Yeah, it basically says that, right? You know, the, the organizational structure is reflected in what you produce. So the software world, basically, your software is going to reflect the organizational structure of the organization. In a, in a detailed way, or in a? Um, well. 
thinking is, look, you know, if um, writing software, you have a team, right, working on a, mo you know, on a section, there's a lot of interactions that go on, right? It's not like you can all just sit in your own rooms and not communicate with each other, and then when you're done, integrate all together and it works, right? So what will happen is when you design your teams, right, the communication network in the, among those teams, across teams, is going to affect where the boundaries are for your software modules, right? Because if, it's, if you've got three people in the same room working together on the same software, you can talk to each other and that works well, but if there's two separate teams in different locations, right, they, and the connection has to go up through the manager and over the other manager and down, right, then you're gonna draw, you're gonna, the software is gonna, there's gonna be a line here, and here's the software we develop, and here's the software they develop, and then we're gonna it, it'll eventually talk to each other, right? So that's what it means that, right, the organizational structure is going to be reflected in what you, you produce. And so some people have like, <laughs> Right, simplify it by saying that, like if you got four groups writing a piece of software, then you can have, and it's, it's gonna compile it, you're gonna get four paths compiler, right? But, you, but again, what's gonna happen, you know what's gonna happen, right? It's like, okay, you guys do this piece, you guys do this piece, you do this piece, and then we'll string it together, right? So that's how the organizational structure, right, is gonna affect, right, what we produce, the structure of what we produce. And Eric Raymond is a guy who wrote the Cathedral and the Bazaar, um, arguing the different open software and versus closed software. Um, and so then Copeland and Harrison, basically what that means is basically your organizational structure is part of your software development process. And you have to figure out what architecture you want and then make the organizational structure fit that because the architectural structure is going to fit the organizational structure. So make sure that the organizational structure is appropriate for what you're trying to develop. Now, the reason I bring this up now is because, right, this came from, you know, a unique company, right? So they, their organizational structure reflected in their process that they developed, right? So it's interesting, right, that it'd be interesting to know more about this process. So techniques, assessing it. Um, has anyone heard of BERT? Which just goes to show you, right? Just look at the, right? There's things that are happening that you'll learn about. Um, make you more aware of what's going on in the field. Um, BERT was released by Google, I don't know, a year or so ago, and it completely changed the way people think about natural language processing. It was significantly better than what people were doing before. You know, language and frameworks, um, actually, 
They didn't have any in the adopt category. Um, part of the problem is if you do this once a year, right, um, things don't change that that fast. That and they, you know, once they once things reach the adopt stage, the next time they don't don't mention it anymore. Um, otherwise, the adopt would be you know just pages and pages, right, of language and processes and techniques to use. Um, But again, it's, it's things that are happening. Um, you know, GraphQL we talked about earlier. Um, Gas, Gatsby JS. Um, has anyone heard of that? Has anyone heard of Node.js? Um, what about single page apps? Where the application is really written in JavaScript, and then when you go to the website, you get the, instead of HTML, you get a JavaScript, right? Um, and then on the client side, the JavaScript generates a page or pages for you. Um, well, one problem with that, there's several problems. One is, if your entire application is written in JavaScript, and you load it up into the, um, the browser to render, um, a lot of search engines can't deal with that. Google can, but some others can't, which means if you want those people, they'll find your website, right? So you're hidden, right? Um, the other problem is may take some time to send all that JavaScript to the client and then the client to generate the page, right? And so what some people do now is you actually pre-render the page, generate an HTML page, so you can send to the client and then send the JavaScript. And then the JavaScript, while well, the user is looking at that HTML page that was first sent, um, you can then replace it with the actual JavaScript version once it's rendered, plus search engines can then search through it, right? Um, so Gatsby JS is a way of taking your JavaScript application and rendering the page for it statically, and then you can you can display the render you can serve the static pages. Um, Swift UI is. part of this movement that both Apple and Google are doing on the, their production mobile platforms to get rid of right, the GUI builders and actually write it all in code. Basically make your code a language that defines the interface. And it's also reactive, so it starts to change how you structure your applications. Um, but again, it's just a, you know, a source of What's happening? What, what should we know about? Um, another place, Hacker News. You spend 10 minutes a day just looking at Hacker News, looking at the, I mean, usually it's like you, you get a one, you know, a two line description of a post and you, know, you cycle through and all oh, that one's interesting. I'll go look at it. Um, 10 minutes a day for six months and in the six months, you'll know a lot more about what's going on than um, you did before. And that, um, you go for job interviews, knowing about all these things is going to be useful because they'll say, well, you know about this? And well, yeah, of course I know about that. Um, let's see. Ah, uh, yes. Dr. Mike. What a nice name, right? Um, 
at the University of Utah. He published an article you know, like, what should computer science majors know, right? Um, so what do you need to know to get a job? Um, maintain life employment. If you want to enter graduate school, um, so it's mainly at the undergraduate level, um, right? First thing it says is the resume does not tell anyone how good a programmer you are, right? You can have a fantastic resume and be a terrible programmer. You could be a fantastic programmer and your resume could not look so great, right? So in the sciences, we don't have a, we don't have this idea of a portfolio. Um, my brother was, was an architect and went to school. When he comes out, you basically have a portfolio you carry around and you like open up and it's like, here are all the, you know, here's all the things I designed, right? All these buildings, I did for projects, blah, blah, blah. Art made are the same thing, right? Um, for us, we could create a portfolio, you know, we can do blogs, um, we can do projects, put them on GitHub, right? Um, you know, we've got student clubs, right? And being part of a student club, you can do projects in a student club, you've got classes they offer, you can, right? So there's ways of um, building up a portfolio of things you do Right, to show the employer that this is me, right? This is what I can do. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, um, the difference is if all you do is do things in class, it looks very passive, right? I'm at the school, I do what, if you, anything extra is like, no, it shows that you're, you're motivated and you're interested. Um, You know, working on open source projects um, for a while, um, building up a Stack Overflow. Um, I forgot what they call it, the rating or whatever they call it. When, when we had, the more questions you answered, the more points you got. Um, all that's died down because there's, after all, how many questions can you ask about Java and answer them, right? I mean. Um, the idea of a, a lone programmer sitting in a cubicle hacking away um, doesn't work very well. You do some of that, but you still need to communicate your ideas to people in the team. Often you have to interact with customers, people, other team members. Um, You know, I used, when I used to go to Uppsala, I would, I would ask people from industry there, you know, what, you know, what do you see that students are lacking? And the number one thing was always this, communication, right? No one ever said, oh, I want students to know more about data structures or algorithms, even though often that's what they ask in interviews, but, they, they assumed that was always going to be there, right? But it was a communication pr issue that was front in their mind. Um, right, in a small company, if you're a, small, if you're a startup company, um, you have to do everything and you can't. Um, and so he has some references, writing for computer science. Um, Right. You know, understanding understanding Unix and the philosophy. Um, you know, just you should be able to use it, right? Um, just a bunch of. I mean, of course, make files is the old version, right? There's 
newer systems that do the same thing, but you just know how to use one of them, right? So you got the idea. Um, just um, you know, it gives you sample tasks, simple thing that you'd be able to do. Um, You know, last is it's good if you're a crossword puzzle person, but it shows you what you can do, right? You know how to manipulate um, the tools. Um, right, you just... Things are supposed to be a room. Yeah. Like just with the show. Yeah. You know, just some basic system end tasks, right? <laughs> I have boxes in my home. I just... Yeah, but you still need the, the cable from the network to your modem to your router. So you can play some of these, you should be able to set up a router, right? Um, configure it, um, understand how that works. Um, you know, it's, so when I was a graduate student, um, My first programming assignment was in Algol. And one floor down and off the side, there was a team of people building what became UCSD Pascal, um, which then became very big, right? Um, and my first job when I got there, they, they asked me, well, who do I think was gonna win the language wars? Was it gonna be C? Modular 2 or Ada? And <laughs> Modular 2 and Ada are like, and that, then it became C++. Um, and, right, when I was teaching here, initially, it was all Pascal. And at some point, Pascal was like, uh, it's getting old in the tooth. What he would do, like, do you do a C plus plus? And they go, I don't think you want beginners to lear be learning C plus um, plus. And so when Java came out, I was like, okay, finally, God, you saved us. Um, but now, I mean, Java is going to be here forever, right? But we're sort of moving beyond that in terms of people now writing language on top of Java to make use of the VM. Um, because Java is, has a lot of boilerplate code, right? So you get Kotlin, right? Um, closure that run on top of. Right. Sure. Some, 
Well, we just keep in mind, there's still a lot of cobalt cold out there. Fortran is still used, right? Um, but, you know, once, you, once you've got 100 million lines of code in a language, it's not going to go away because no one's going to replace it, right? So these languages don't go away, right? They sort of stagnate. I mean, C++, um, when's the next standard coming out? Is it next year or the year after? I think it's, I mean, there's another, there is a, there's a 19, yeah. What? Yeah, I know it's in it, right? But it's there. So these languages, they don't go away. Um, but it doesn't mean that they're going to be the, the ones you want to be using the rest of your life, right? And so, yeah, you know, learn different languages, and here's his list, right? Um, of course, this was done a number of years ago, so his list probably has changed, but it's, again, it's just a range of different types of languages. Um, and, you know, Racket is this version of the list. He says, yeah, aggressively simple syntax. I mean, his list was parentheses, right? Um, and then he says, yeah, for some students, they won't be able to handle it. And he doesn't pull any punches. Like, if you, if it, if Lisp is, if you can't wrap your head around Lisp, then you may want to think about a different career. Um, Now the problem with some of language like Lisp, um, Lisp is different enough that in like a program languages course, I don't like to teach Lisp. Why? Because it's so different and you're covering three or four or five languages, you only get a little short time with it. And what you learn is you learn to hate the language. It's like, I can't do anything, it doesn't work. Right, it's too frustrating, and by the time you, by the time you almost start to catch on, it's like it's time to go on to something else. Um, it takes time to understand, incorporate how you do things. Yeah, I kind of agree with that because I took the Fortran class way, way back. Yeah, I remember that as the language that did nothing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't do, you can't do anything, right? You can't do anything. You can't do anything, and. Yeah, that's that's what you learn, right? It's like it's worthless. I mean, it's it's too frustrating. Don't ever use it. Yeah, if taught correctly, I mean, it, not in two weeks, not in three weeks. I mean, it's just the few times I've been able to teach a, a course on functional programming, right? I assume it's gonna take three weeks for students to go to the fact that there's no for loop. Because that's such built in to what we do, right? For, you know, for I equals, or for, I mean, that's for, it's just so fundamental and like, no, no, you can't do that. Um, another reference, right? How to design programs that talks about how to write programs in Racket. And it's an online book, so it's free. Um, more interesting. Um, so Squeak is a implementation of Smalltalk. Um, so what happened, Smalltalk was developed with Xerox in the 1970s. Um, by Alan Kay and his group. And then it was eventually, Xerox had no idea. Xerox invented all kinds of stuff, but they couldn't figure out how to deal with it because it wasn't a Xerox machine. So what do we do? 
And so I spit out this company to sell it, and that eventually turned into visual works, small talk. Um, and at one point, Alan Kay was frustrated with what was going on in languages, so it's it's time to you know go back to small talk and use that as an experiment. Um, and so they then went back to one of the older versions of small talk, which was by then available without a license agreement, and they turned it into squeak. And so he and a bu bunch of people volunteered to you know create this system. Um, and everything's an object. I mean, everything. A class is an object. So, like you said, it really helps you understand this concept, what it means to be an object. Um, architecture, right? I mean, you should understand how these machines work. I mean, you said that many times, right? I mean, once you get more complicated, you're basically inventing a new language, right? And then I guess, and then your session you build becomes complicated enough. You're doing a mini operating system. All right, just. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, just and this is more important than any than ever, right? Because everything's not worked now. Um I once asked some people to, to write a, well, I should, used to have students write clients and servers. Um, initially, it was sort of panics, like, how can I do that? I mean, um, it's not that hard to send an email. It's really not, right? Um, oh yeah, yeah. Right, so just, even just going to a coffee shop then, right? Just, And security is like, I mean, if you had half, of an, like, half a clue of how insecure our systems are. Yeah. Right. And he actually wrote a book called Be Gone, but it's all about, I agree. Computer science is woefully undertrained for and, security. Yeah. And really, everyone. Security. Yeah. Right. I mean, I mean all these things are just to be. Is it, is it, right. Yeah. Cross scripting, yeah. Yeah. So just, we're not talking about the really subtle things, right? I mean, we're just talking, 
mean, Buffer Overflow has been known for decades, right? Or something. I mean, who? I mean, yeah. And so you get several references, which are. Yeah, so what he does is he, he basically has students turn in all the signs electronically, and then other students are, you get to attack their programs. He says they write much better tests that way, right? Well, to break the other students' code, not, they don't write very good tests to write, secure their code, but. Um, You know, particularly now since data science has become so popular, um, this um, book is very, very good. It's not necessarily dedicated towards computer science, but it just talks about data and how to display it and very graphical and shows all kinds of ways it's done and not done. Um, Lots of tricks, right? Lots of how to get the, how to hacks get things done quickly, fastly. Um, and he talked about other other things too, but it's again just you know it's a big field. Lots of things going on. Um, You're not going to learn a fraction of what you need to know for your entire career at school, right? You always have to be. So I feel like it's almost time to display. And, yeah, that's, but again, that's, that's designed for scientists that use computers, right? Um, some schools, software engineering is a separate major. Yeah. And we're, you know, we're in the process of, of redoing our curriculum, and there will be three separate tracks. Although, because of all the regulations, and we can't call them tracks or something, I have no idea why, but um, it's like data science will be one track. And although there'll be some courses you have to, everyone has to take, and then if you're on this track, you take these other requirements. And, Um, and one last thing, um, he was a, this guy was a graduate student at University of the Georgia Tech, um, which is a pretty high powered computer science place. Um, it's, he says, yeah, if you, um, Yeah, my friend came across a, a student who graduated from UC Santa Barbara, and she told me a story about this one instructor she just hated. I mean, she just despised this guy. Why? Because she have a problem, she'd go to him, and you ask a question, like, oh, go look it up. Just go, look, I mean, that's all you just go look it up, go look it up, right? Go look it up. Um, and then she, when she got out in her first job, she's like, couldn't understand why all the, all the new hires couldn't get anything done. Well, you just go look it up. Um, you know, you know, he had trained her to, you know, I mean, get to dig into those 
books and manuals and, and stuff to find out what you need to know. And so she got used to doing that. And then when she got to work, she could, she could actually do it. Um, that's way different from my experience now than years ago. Old yeah. Science. It used to be hard to figure out. You know, like every time a cow do I? I know. It's right. Yeah. Cut three cows on like Stack Overflow. Exactly what you need. And it's, we haven't figured out how to deal with that. Um, in terms of um, what you did 20 years ago was good training, right? But you had to think about what's going on and how do, how, how do I solve this problem? Now it's like, well, it's not a stack overflow, so what do I do? Oh, we're, other classes do in Swift UI, but this, there's not many answers on Stack Overflow, like, yeah, okay, so, but you need to be able to figure out how to solve your problem, right? How do you investigate that? How do you figure what's going on? How do you, and being able to Google it, we start to rely on, I just do, you know, just, how do I do this? And if it's not there, then, I don't know. So, we don't know how to how do we train students in that environment to be able to go and do what you had to do twenty years ago. Um, right. And what? Right. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you want to be the, the person who can answer the questions on Stack Overflow. Um, right, so he says, yeah, I mean, you're a CS student, so join, right? Be you know, part of the clubs. Um, It's sort of embarrassing, like, it happens every once in a while, like, my computer crashed. Well, okay, well, do you have a backup? No. That's, oh, wow. Well, come on, don't you, you're, you're a computer science major, right? So don't you know these things happen? I mean, hard drives fail, and, oh, by the way, solid state drives, when they fail, it's gone. I mean, with, with, with magnetic disks, I mean, it, it Yeah.